Absolutely. My name's Andre Baruch and I'm the President of the Commercial Passenger Vehicle Association of Australia. Chair, committee members, thank you for asking me to present to you and to the inquiry into the Commercial Passenger Vehicle Industry Reforms 2017. I appreciate the kindness of the invitation to appear here to support the submission made by the Commercial Passenger Vehicle Association of Australia. The CPVAA is the largest member association registered with Com Consumer Affairs Victoria that represents owners, drivers and stakeholders in the point-to-point -point passenger, passenger transport industry. As such, we are very aware of the 2017 legislation, its good points, its bad points and the consequences, both intended and unintended, that have come from this. I would like to address my limited remarks here to four salient points that I and the CPVAA believe are key to this inquiry. These are, firstly, the $1 CPV levy that has been introduced by the legislation. Secondly, compensation for all participants that has to recognise that property has been destroyed and confiscated as a result of this legislation. Thirdly, safety and compliance issues in the industry currently and in the future. And fourthly, the unsustainability of the industry as it currently is. The $1 levy has been introduced by the government's legislation to enable it to recoup the cost of compensation. The problem here as we see it is twofold. Firstly, this is a pure consumption tax and it's an inefficient tax that requires a lot of resources to monitor and collect. Furthermore, there's no data available to the SRO, the State Revenue Office, to indicate the levels of funding that they should be receiving through the levy. Prior to the legislation being introduced, there was a requirement for all network operators to report statistics, like the number of trips they did per quarter, to the regulator. Today, the deregulator doesn't ask for this information. There is no way that the SRO can know if a self-reported figure is accurate. We are led to understand that there is widespread non-compliance. Secondly, we believe there is a much more efficient way to raise money. As we've suggested in our report on page 21, a $2,500 registration fee, payable quarterly to Vic Roads, is not only a much simpler form of revenue raising, it's not a tax and it's not passed on to the paying consumer. The registration fee is a much fairer system. It's pay to play. If you don't want to pay the fee, don't be in the industry. We note it's simply a cost of business and not a barrier of entry, as some have suggested. As our submission shows on very conservative figures, this levy would enable the fair buyback of every taxi and hire car licence owned prior to this legislation coming into effect in just over 10 years. From then on, the revenue goes straight to the bottom line of the Victorian government. It's a registration fee with no associated additional collection costs. Compensation for all participants in the industry. We illustrate in our submission on pages 23 and 24 what we believe is a fair and reasonable buyback price point for each and every licence. The current system that valued a second licence at half the price of the first is just ridiculous. Chair, if you owned two identical townhouses in a street and the government told you they're taking them away from you, oh and by the way, the second's only worth 50% of the first, mm. would you be happy? Let me extend that metaphor. If you owned a third and a fourth and a fifth, and the government told you for the fifth and any subsequent, well, you don't need any payments. Would you be happy? As an industry, we weren't. Just last week, a Supreme Court judge noted that it has already been established that taxi licences are property. The same judge wondered why this is still being hashed around in court in July 2019. Australia is the country of the fair go. Let's ensure that this government is remembered through the work of this committee as the one that ensured that all participants in the CPV industry get a fair go and fair compensation. Safety and compliance. No one denies that safety is the most important issue to CPVs. The industry has to operate both with regard to preventative measures and to ensure compliance to the laws and regulations. As such, the CPVAA firmly believes every CPV vehicle should have a proper roadworthy carried out by a Vic Roads licensed vehicle tester every year, that there should be safety cameras in each and every CPV on the road, and that strong legislative measures are taken to ensure the correct and active management of driver fatigue. Prior to the legislation being passed, there were approximately 5,600 taxis and 2,700 hire cars on Victoria's roads. I believe Mr Barton is the exact figures. According to the CPVV website, as of the 30th of June 2019, last month, 
There were 57,558 hire cars, including rideshare vehicles, 10,143 taxis, and 943 WAVs, wheelchair accessible vehicles operating. A total of 68,644 CPV vehicles on the road. I'm led to believe that currently the CPVV, the regulator, has approximately eight compliance officers working. It would take them a year to inspect each vehicle once, and this assumes they're inspecting one vehicle an hour, hour in, hour out, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, non-stop, around the clock for an entire year. It's obvious to us that the CPVV is under-resourced in this area, and we believe that alternate forms of resourcing should be looked at. Finally, for now, unsustainability. The industry, as shown by the figures just mentioned, has grown disproportionately to demand. In 2015, there were approximately 8,500 taxis and hire cars operating in Victoria. At that time, our population was 5.97 million people. This gave us a ratio of one vehicle per 702 people. Today, last month into June, there are 68,644 vehicles registered and 98,209 CPV drivers registered. Population Australia states that Victoria has 6.27 million people and we find we have one vehicle per 91 people. This is almost an eight-fold increase in supply. All of us in the CPV industry wish that demand had grown to match that. I look forward to your questions, and again, I thank you all for the opportunity to address you all here today. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks, Andre. Um, can we, you just give us a little, um, a bit of, about the rundown over the compensation and the properties? Sure. The compensation was announced on a entity basis and I'll just focus on taxis, although it's the same in the taxis and the hire cars, just different figures, that the first licence that an entity owned, compensation was given at $100,000. For the second, third and fourth licence that an entity owned, it was given for $50,000. If that entity was fortunate enough through hard work through, over the generations to own more than four licences, so sorry, too bad, there's nothing there. It was the same in the hire cars. I'm stressing per entity, if, we, if I had set up my business arrangements such that I owned a taxi licence in my name, in my wife's name, in a company, and in a super fund, that's four separate entities, I would have got $400,000 for it. If through good fortune, bad fortune, I owned those four licences in the same entity, I only would have got $250,000 for it. Sorry, what was the second part of the question, Rod? No, we'll just keep moving because we're, we're tight for time and the chair's looking That's at right. me to keep, <laughs> keep me in check. Um, but th that was one of the issues really about the unfairness of how the compensation was applied through the entity where one person, uh, two people can own 10 licences each, one can end up with 250000 the other one could end up with a million dollars. Correct. It's, yeah, so... It was absolutely unfair how it was structured, how it was designed. I believe there wasn't a lot of thought designed, thought put into it to look at who the ultimate owners of the licences were, who the ultimate beneficiaries were. What is the association's view on the levy, mate? I'm under privilege. I can say it's a waste of time, it's a waste of space, it's expensive. We don't believe it's the best way forward. From what we've heard anecdotally, it's leaky. As Mr Samuel said previously, they tell their drivers what to do, they can't guarantee that they do it. You know, we don't know that everyone's reporting, we don't know the quantities they're reporting. I would suggest to the committee that they look at some of the larger rideshare operators and what they are reporting and try to find out how close it is to the actual truth in terms of the numbers of jobs they're actually doing because I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I bet a bob each way that they're not telling the truth to the number of jobs they're actually doing versus what they're reporting they're doing. The levy, it tax the travelling public. For those grannies taking a taxi to go to the doctors, a $1 levy, or $1.10 levy, because there's GST on GST. it as well, a $1 levy on a $10 fare is 10%. I took a taxi to come in here today. It cost me $50, including the $1 levy. That's about 2%. There's a, it's a very inequitable levy in how it's been structured, because it's a per-trip basis rather than a percentage basis. 
as we said in our submission, much better off is to put a registration fee on every vehicle that's a CPV operator. You don't have to worry about levies, you don't have to worry about staff, you don't have to worry about stretching the resources of the SRO, it just works. The same way as road as vehicle registration just works. In your submission, uh, the, the annual uh, licence fee or permit, <coughs> excuse me, um, you'd like to see uh, as part of the conditions of that, that is, that uh, a, a vehicle roadworthy certificate should be supplied. Yes. And also a uh, insurance, a commercial passenger vehicle insurance, so that they should be, uh, could, could you explain to us what, how do you see that working? Should be a law. Should be very simple. If you want to operate a commercial passenger vehicle, you have a primary responsibility for safety and for insurance, if you don't have commercial passenger vehicle insurance, and that includes personal and public liability insurance, if somebody trips getting out of your car, they can sue you, and if you're not covered by insurance, it can be a very, very expensive trip. It's for the protection of the drivers. The insurance is a necessity. The roadworthies, on a yearly basis, ensures that the vehicles that are on the road, on average, much more often than any other vehicle, are kept in a safe and roadworthy condition. As a member of the travelling public, when I get into a CPV, I want to know that the car is safe, that I am safe travelling in it, and that the driver is safe. Sorry, David. Sorry, this has embarrassed me. It's all right. <laughs> I've done the wrong thing. Um, you knew you now. You had a new Spotify playlist, too, David. No, no. I think. Um, my question is further about the levy, too, mm -hmm. and I understand you, the model that you're proposing is a different one to uh, an upfront fee, an annual fee, but given that we've got the levy now um, and that the levy is used in part to fund bureaucrats as opposed to compensation... That's you... just wrong, isn't it, David? Well, that's my point. That's, that's... your view. The levy right. was designed and put in place to help with the funding of the taxi licences that were confiscated by the government that were devalued to zero. It slipped through the murky fine print in the legislation that this would actually go into general revenue. No, no, we opposed it, but that's, that's another point. But it is, in my view, and you know, clearly I have that view, that it's um, the wrong destination for that fund, however it's, it is it's collected. It's not often that I will agree with you, particularly publicly, but in this case, 100%. Well, I think it's not often, actually, you do agree with me. <laughs> um, so that's the first point. The, the, the second point is you're advising us, in a sense, to investigate the collections by a number of the larger firms. Yes. And you're saying that, in your view, uh, there are a large number of rides that are not... Um, in cases where the ride occurs and a levy is collected or is not collected... David, I am not saying that. What I am saying is that currently the deregulator has no way of knowing that because there's no requirement under the existing legislation for the number of rides that a rideshare network operator, BSP, does to be reported. Therefore, if that number's not being reported, they can report what they want to the SRO and it's self-reporting. There's nothing to verify so, the accuracy But the, of the that. SRO, under its more general powers, has powers to uh, look at documents and to investigate those from whom it's collecting yes, it taxes. Yes, it has the power to, whether it whether chooses to yeah. is a different question that you're not asking, thankfully, because I couldn't answer that. Yes. But they don't have a guidance of what levels they should be looking for. Right. So is it your view that the SRO should assure itself that it's collecting the correct amount? I would have thought that was its fundamental responsibility. And when they come here, we will ask them those questions. Uh, if we don't get satisfactory answers, then you're suggesting that we should look further. I think it would be much simpler to scrap the levy and go with the registration model, as we suggested. If that's not possible... Don't understand why it wouldn't be possible. This is Parliament. You guys make the laws. Mm. All right. Thank you. Tim, are you there? All right. Um...
Um, so just on the the uh, levy or the registration model you're proposing, that is uh, basically going to be squeezing out part-time drivers, isn't it? If they're all paying a flat fee and a lot of the ride-sharing drivers are not driving full-time, they're going to be paying far more of the cost. It's a cost of business, Tim. So you think that's a good idea to push out the part-timers? I don't think it necessarily has to push out the part-timers. That levy works out to be approximately $48 a week. If a part-timer is only making $48 a week, my opinion is they should ask themselves why they're doing it in the first place. And if they're making more than that, which surely they must be doing, then it's a cost of business. I think it's a lot easier to implement that and regulate that than it is with the current levy. Um, all right. I think a in-between in way would be a percentage system of fees raised. Um, anyway, um, I do think there could be uh, data matching going on between the, the, the State Revenue Office and the ATO with the, with the monthly basses that drivers are putting in. Um, what I had, I think I, another point here somewhere. Um, so you're arguing that we should um, have barriers to entry to uh, prevent oversupply of drivers, but um, one thing that a free market does very well is regulate supply. Um, when the returns go down, people go exit the industry. Um, so why do you think we need to artificially limit the supply? Tim, can I ask you, why does the Victorian government legislate that there are liquor licences that cost money to acquire? That's a very if good I, question. If I want to operate a bar, why can't I just open the doors and sell booze to people? Yeah, I'm on the same page with, as you on that one. I'd there's go a, there's for it. There's a liquor licence which is a cost of doing business. We're saying the vehicle registration is simply a cost of doing business. Factor it into your calculations, the same way you factor in anything else in any other industry. You okay, Tim? Done? Okay, no, that's fine. Yep. Thank you. If there's no other questions on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you for your time and contribution. You that's will right. receive in a few weeks' time a copy of the transcripts for you to prove it and correct any typographical error. Thank you all for your time thank and you. patience.